Yeah. 
Christian Ministries presents Start Our Sabbath. SOS, the live Friday night program to help you and your family start your Sabbath off right. You've had a tough week, and now it's time to relax and spend time with God's people from all around the world. That's why Wes and Nancy White invite you into their living room to relax and enjoy life. As always, we'll have lively Bible topics and we'll examine current events. Your input is welcome. We want you to talk to us in our chat room. We want to hear your comments and your questions. So get your dinner and your Bible ready for tonight's show. I'm your announcer, Gary Gibbons. We're here in our studios in Big Sandy, Texas. And here is your host, for Start Our Sabbath, Wes White. Good evening and welcome to our 60-second show of Start Our Sabbath. We're the weekly show that tie, tries to help you welcome the Sabbath into your life in a positive and happy note. And we thank you for inviting us into your living room to spend an hour or so with us as we talk about topics that we hope will help you in your walk with Christ. We try to have fun on this show, but once in a while, Wes enters into some controversial area that gets my stomach tied up in knots. Oh, well, poor thing. Here you go. Try this Pepto-Bismol. Now, we hope that you had a good week. Uh, for those of you who live in the northern climes like Canada, we hope you're enjoying all this warm weather. Good point. We just had our first official day of summer a week or two ago. And at this point, a lot of people are thinking, now it's summer, I'm going to hike, I'm going to go camping, I'm going to hit the beach. And meanwhile, the air conditioner and Netflix are like, sure you are, yeah, right. <laughs> well, we want to extend a big thank you to Carl Nocturne, um for his hard work on tonight's show. Yeah, uh, Carl is the one who connects our Facebook feed to the YouTube feed. I think you need to get closer to your microphone. Okay. And then that way people who don't have Facebook can watch the show by going to our uh, website, dynamicchristianministries.org. And also, uh, Carl is the one who put together this uh, intro that you hear um, every Friday night. Carl's the one who produced it and cut all the video and put it back together. Great. Great so job. thank you very much, Carl, for all your expertise and help. Now, uh, what about Bill, sweetheart? Uh, is Bill going to be on the show tonight? No, Bill can't make it tonight. Uh, you know, Bill's pretty upset these days, but that's not why he's not here. He's not upset at us. Oh, he's not upset at us. Well, then why is, what's Bill so upset about? Well, the state of California is now debating the possibility of breaking the state into three different groups. Oh, yeah, he mentioned that to me a week or so ago. And, you know, this is going to be a long, long legislative process. Well, I've been thinking about that. It doesn't have to take that long. If I remember my classes in government right, um, all it would take would be for the United States Congress to pass a law to resolve this. Really? You want the United States Congress to solve a problem? Have you met the United States Congress? I mean, they're still finalizing the Louisiana Purchase. Yeah. <laughs> wow. and, and I don't think this process of breaking up California through voting is all that necessary anyway. No? Why don't you? Uh, well... Because all they have to do is just sit tight and wait for the big earthquake to break up the state anyway. So, <laughs> uh, One last thing about Bill. We always talk about how Bill is German, and I believe that right now he is thrilled to know that scientists in Germany have programmed a robot to hug humans. And you know, there's all this research that says that hugging can reduce stress and prevent illness. Yeah, but why would that make Bill happy? Well, you know, Bill is not a hugger. 
No. Yeah, you're right. He's a strict German. He doesn't like hugging. So what's your point? Well, then Bill has to be excited about this new hugging robot because from now on, when someone in the church tries to hug Bill, Bill's going to say, oh, you need a hug? Let me build you a robot. The robot, he will hug you. <laughs> wow. Well, let's get serious. All right. Bill has a wonderful Facebook group that's called Seventh-day Sabbath Keepers. We recommend that you follow it. Yeah, this Facebook Facebook group has over 18,000 followers. It's got some great material. Again, the name is Seventh-day Sabbath Keepers. Uh, so why don't you check it out? Tonight, we've tried to put together a really good show for you. We've got some fun and interesting topics for you. Wes is going to talk about Judeo-Christian ethics and how they tie into the belief that the New Testament writers thought Jesus was going to return in their lifetime. And Nancy is going to talk about Siri navigation. Siri is one of my favorite things in the whole wide world. When I travel, I love Siri. Well, in light of your talking about how much you love another woman, let's open with prayer. Okay, would you bow your heads, please? Our Father in Heaven, we thank you so much for your seventh-day Sabbath that's upon us now. In some parts of the world, it's already there. We thank you for your obedient ones who are not only accepting Jesus Christ as their Savior and trying to emulate him, but they're also being obedient to your commandments. Please put your blessing on those people. Now, Father, please be with us tonight. Help us to fellowship in love. Help us to always be forgiving for one another. Help us to always be merciful to each other because... If we have perfect understanding of doctrine and prophecy and the Torah and all that, it's all nothing. It's just a clanging bell if we don't have love and forgiveness and tenderness and mercy. So help that to always be a part of our show. Please be with us tonight as we try to emulate Jesus Christ in the Sermon on the Mount as we go through our lives. In Jesus' name, we give you praise and thanks for all of this. Amen. Amen. Okay. I'm really happy uh, to be here tonight. Um, with our brothers and sisters as we fellowship in Christian love. And you know, this is a great time to be alive. I mean, God has blessed us with so much by giving us his law. And God's law is so helpful to us as we try to live our lives in this extremely difficult world. Yeah, and then on top of that, we have the shed blood of Jesus, which gives us life eternal in his kingdom. That's right. So it's great to be alive. It's great to have this wonderful information that God has given us in his word. And it's great to be here with all of you tonight. Uh, as we reflect on all these things that we have to be thankful for. So, Nancy, uh, what do you got going in the uh, chat room tonight? Well, probably a lot, but I haven't had a chance to look at it. You gave me a bunch of extra places to try and post tonight. So. Oh, okay. Um, Brian Renard says, Happy Sabbath from Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. I've been through Hamilton. I love that area. Alicia Monroe Prime says, Happy Sabbath. Uh, my family love you all. We love you too, Alicia. Yes, uh, Will Love Al says, Happy Sabbath from Columbia, South Carolina, with his family there. Okay. Bill Lucenhide is there. Bill. Bill. How you doing, buddy? Um, so, oh, I wasn't able to post to your group. I hope you're doing it. No, um, that's on your list. I know. I couldn't get to it. Oh, okay, Bill, she couldn't get to it, so you're going to have to <laughs> I post. I tried, I tried. Okay, wait a minute. Bill, please post to Seventh-day Sabbath Keepers. Nancy couldn't get to it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Bob Petty says, good evening. Kevin O'Hare, otherwise known as Kevin from Hesville, hey, says, Kevin. happy Sabbath, everyone. Yeah. Uh, James Marinek says, hey, Wesley. Uh, uh, Don Krantz says, howdy, everyone, from sunny, scorching uh, Phoenix, Arizona. Ugh. Well, not today, but I think there's been a few days we put, you know, we had a competition with you. Uh, John Black says, Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Mimi's with us, and so is Carl. Uh, Jerry Stubbs is with us. Rod Kuzman. Diane Kitchener Taylor Webb says, "Sorry, she's late. Diane, you couldn't have been that late." Uh, uh, Diane, let me say something interesting about okay. Diane. Uh, the music that you hear in the beginning of the show mm -hmm. is um, uh, it's uh, me and two uh, girl singers. We okay. did all these songs, mm -hmm. and we recorded them live in a church in Atlanta, no, Linden, Texas, mm -hmm. or Lin uh, Diane uh, Webb was there when we recorded That's right, them. She was. And she's probably the only person watching tonight who was there during the recording and she probably recognizes her grandson's voice talking between the songs. Right? <laughs> oh, okay. Um, on YouTube we've got uh, Mimi and Trudy Cranford and then Barb Shanks from Montgomery, Alabama. 
Uh, Paul Shaw is with us tonight. Hey, Paul. And Trudy Cranford said German. Uh, she's German and doesn't like hugging. <laughs> just wired that way. Oh, speaking of Germans, Birgit uh, Sellers is with us as well. So is, she, there you is, go. is Birgit a, a hugger? She'll have to tell us. Okay. okay. Dan Krantz thinks we're running off the uh, camera mic instead of the ones at the table. So really, oh bummer. Um, no, my mic says on, so something's going on. All right, hold on a second. Tell tell me in the chat room. Can you hear this? And can you hear this? Because we tested it early, right? Yeah, but it doesn't. What happens in the test doesn't necessarily translate into the show. Well, we'll have to talk loud just in case we're going into the camera mic, which is about what. Yeah, five I don't. Feet I don't have any trouble with that. Yeah. So you know, right. for Makes me, sense. you might need to speak up, but for me, my normal tone of voice will do it just well. What else you got? Um, let's see. Verge Cordal, uh, Verge Cordal is with us. Tony Bueno is with us. Tony is from Colorado. True Life Community Lakewood Fellowship. Happy Sabbath. Thank you for being here. David Lind is with us. Jeffrey Flum says, Happy Sabbath from Northwest Chicago land. All right. Um, Jose uh, Howanek is with us. Richard Mendez says, Oh, yeah, it's time for SOS. Hello, Wes and Nancy. <laughs> We're glad you're with us. We're glad you're with us, too, yes. Richard. Uh, uh, Bill, says, Bill sends hugs to everyone. Okay. I assume that spills over to the people in the uh, YouTube chat room. Okay. Uh, Tammy Brown Gilbert is watching. From Texarkana. That's right. All right. Joe Ferguson says hello. Let's see. Uh, Priscilla Hawkins is watching. Oh. And Kevin says it's safe to share now. Wes's monologue is over. <laughs> <laughs> and Bill says he posted a seventh day Sabbath Keepers. Thanks, Bill. Okay. We got the other ones, though, Bill. A Andy Nutt is with us. Uh, Bill Bratt says happy Sabbath to everyone. Peter Kamen says here I are. Jen Turner says hello, all. Uh, Diane says that would have been Asher. I thought, yeah, I guess it was Asher. He was a little back then. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. Let's see. Um, Reed Harding Bradwell says good Sabbath evening. Richard Maxwell says no sound from Mike. So there you go. Hello uh, from Andalusia, Alabama, says Sue Weaver. Uh, mm -hmm. Bob Petty says sounds okay, but table mics are out. Oh, bummer. And uh, let's see, that's that's it. Do we have anything else here? I think I covered, oh, Al Bundy 59 is with us and says, hi, Shabbat Shalom. So. Well, we're sorry that these table mics aren't working. So uh, let me go find a hammer and we'll start beating <laughs> on them uh, to take well, out my fix frustration. Them during my, my I don't think, I'm afraid to touch anything because the whole show will go off the air. Now, Nancy's going to get started in her presentation, but before she does, I want to do a quick follow-up on something that we looked into last Friday evening. And this little tidbit that I'm about to give you real quick is something that some of you dog lovers might find interesting. On our last show, we talked about how some scientists estimate that perhaps 90% of the American Indian uh, population got wiped out by the diseases that the Europeans brought over here across the Atlantic. Well, it's, it turns out that it's not just the humans who died as a result of this migration of Europeans to the New World in the 1500s. And I'm going to quote from an article that just came out today. I found it this morning while I was eating my breakfast. It was written by Robert Preit, P-R-E-I-D-T, if you want to look him up. He's from CBS News. The date of the article is today. Quote, in a tragic twist of canine fate, researchers point that dogs that lived in the Americas for thousands of years were all wiped out after the Europeans arrived on the continent. The study demonstrates that the history of humans is mirrored in our domestic animals. People in Europe and the Americas <coughs> were genuinely distinct, and so were their dogs. And just as the indigenous people in the Americas were displaced by the European colonists, the same is true of their dogs. Still quoting, it says, A team of scientists analyzed genes from dog remains at archaeological sites in Siberia and North America and found that dogs that originally lived in the Americas were genetically unlike anywhere else in the world. But their numbers quickly declined after the Europeans started arriving in the Americas around the 15th century. The scientists found it fascinating that a population of dogs that inhabited many parts of the Americas for thousands of years and that was an integral part of so many Native American cultures 
could have disappeared so rapidly. Remember last, and this is me talking, remember last week we talked about how the demographics of, of this continent shifted very dr uh, dramatically and rapidly, and they're shifting once again back in the other direction. Finally, uh, still quoting the article, it says, their near total disappear disappearance, meaning the dogs, is likely due to the combined effects of disease, cultural persecution, and biological changes, starting with the arrival of Europeans, end quote. Again, we talked about this subject of depopulation back in SOS 61, uh, which was, I think, last Friday night. We're on 62 tonight, aren't we? So if you want to go back and check out SOS 61 and see uh, what we talked about demographics, you can go to dynamicchristianministries.org. Okay, what have you got for us tonight, Nancy? Well, in Joshua 14.10, quoting Joshua, we find this. And now, behold, the Lord... Uh, has kept me alive, even uh, as he said, these 45 years, even since the Lord spoke this word unto Moses, while the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness. Key phrase, wandered in the wilderness. And now, lo, I am this day four score and five years old. Ever seen one of these? Family Circle cartoons in the Sunday newspaper where Billy wanders a neighborhood, a dashed line showing all this crazy, disorganized path? Yeah, and I've never found anything cute or funny in that comic strip, The Family Circle. Just, I don't get it. Yes, okay. you're more of a pearls before swine. Uh, indeed, I am. Pearls before yeah, swine. Yeah, connected yeah. to rat. Yeah, rat. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's fine, but this picture does illustrate my point. Or perhaps you've seen this cartoon where you got men shopping and women shopping. Yeah, the men are in blue, the women are in pink. Yeah. Okay. So, um, this is what I think about when I hear the word wander. This kind of thing, or, or Billy from fam the family cartoon we just showed. A sort of purposeless or aimless or distracted ambling around, not necessarily without objective or destination, destination, but certainly without a determined path. Is this a fair um, application for the word wandered in regards to what happened with Israel? The Hebrew word translated wandered in Joshua 14.10 means to walk, to go, come, depart, proceed, move, go away. Or to lead, bring, lead away, carry, cause to walk. It stands in stark contrast to the word used for Hagar's uh, wandering as uh, outlined in Genesis 21:14. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and took bread and a bottle of water and gave it to Hagar, putting it on her shoulder. And the child with her and sent her away. And she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Be Beersheba. She wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. The word used here for Hagar's wandering is to err, to go astray, wander, stagger. This definition more closely aligns with the modern use of the word wander as, as we typically use it today. Hagar staggered around in the wilderness with no clear objective as to where she was headed, and it could have resulted in the death of her son had God not intervened. But Israel, Israel did not wander, not in the same way that Hagar did. They were led. God caused them to depart, to proceed, to go to walk. Siri, that all-knowing talking app on my iPhone, has led me astray a time or two. Construction on the roadway often throws her off, but usually I can rely on her to get me from point A to point B via the fastest route, which, as you know, is not always the shortest distance. Even when I have no idea how to get somewhere, Siri does, and since I can, can't read the phone screen when I drive, I am forced to listen to her voice. We read this in Exodus 13, 18, and verses 21 and 22. But God led the people around by the way of the wilderness toward the Red Sea. And the people of Israel went up out of the land of Egypt equipped for battle. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them along the way, and by night in a pillar of fire that gave them light, that, <clears throat> that they might travel by day and by night. Verse 22, the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night did not depart from before the people. God was taking Israel to the promised land. They knew that. Perhaps their journey would have looked more like the man shopping in this diagram uh, if they hadn't sinned. However, due to their sin, it looked like uh, more like the path of the woman shopping here in the red line. <clears throat> the way they went was not the shortest route. They it certainly wasn't the fastest route. It took them 40 years to get to where they were going. However, it would be a misrepresentation of our loving Father to say that he didn't plan every step along the way of their journey. Do you think he didn't know the exact 
distance to the next clean water source? Of course he did. Do you think maybe he was surprised by the weather they encountered along the way? Of course not. He controls the weather. Everything was under his control. God knew the way that he intended them to go. Every single step Israel took, um, by the way, was led by the pillar of uh, cloud by day or the pillar of fire by night. Whether they rested or moved uh, forward was directed by God through these clear signs. They knew that the destination was still the promised land, but they no longer knew the path to get there. For that reason, they had no choice but to trust God to lead them via the cloud and the fire. He didn't give them weeks advanced direction. He led them day by day. In a way, God even packed for them. Nehemiah 9.21 says, uh, Forty years you sustained them in the wilderness, and they lacked nothing. Their clothes did not wear out, and their feet did not swell. So he, and he also provided their food, quail and manna. He led them to water. He made sure their clothes didn't wear out. God is the perfect trip planner. If we let him control every aspect of our journey through this life, he will never lead us astray. We'll never wander aimlessly. We already know that where we're going, don't we? We know we're going to the promised land of eternity in his kingdom. We just don't always know the way. So we have to rely on him to lead us, to listen to his voice. Even when he leads me through a storm, even when the past seems unclear to me, even when I wonder if my life has taken a wrong turn, even when it feels more like wandering than navigating, I must trust him to lead me. You know, after I updated my iPhone when I got the last new one a couple of years ago, I was able to just, just say, hey Siri, navigate to, and oh, I knew she was going to do that, she responded to me, <laughs> navigate to and give her an address or simply a name of someone whose address is already in my phone. Similarly, the Psalms are full of examples of asking God to handle the direction. Psalm 5, 8, lead me, O Lord, in your righteousness, because my enemies make, because of my enemies, make your way straight before me. Psalm 27, 11, teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me on a level path because of my enemies. Psalm 119, 35, lead me in the path of your commandments, for I delight in it. Psalm 139, 24, and see if there be grief, any grievous way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Psalm 143.10, finally, teach me to do your will, for you are my God. Let your good spirit lead me on level ground. Note that the psalmist, even in a couple places, asks for level ground. I sure ask for that too. Level ground, a smooth path, safe travels, clear direction, even the quickest path with the least traffic. Now, trust me when I say you can ask for that too. Our God wants to handle the navigation. The problem is that just like I sometimes argue with Siri, I will sometimes try to push back on God's direction. Do I really have to go there? Do I really have to do that? Isn't there some other way, Father? Instead of trusting him when I ask for his direction. Dare we say, hey, Abba, navigate to your kingdom. Go ahead. You can rely on him. You won't wander aimlessly. He already knows the destination. He knows how to navigate us through the best way to get there. Unique to each and every one of us. I welcome your thoughts and comments and your questions. You can write me in the chat room or at dynamicchristianministries.org at Nancy. Okay, uh, Z St. Hope says, Delightful Sabbath to all our blessed makers and sanctifiers command. Uh, Birgit says, I, um, I that was for somebody else. Okay, let's see, who else? Uh, Daryl Ambrose is with us and says, Hi, everyone. And Rod Kuzman says, It's interrupting. Amy Hohurst has joined us and says, Happy Sabbath, Pete. Uh, Larry Evans said, I didn't know Indians had dogs, but they they didn't have horses until the Spaniards came. That's true. Mm -hmm. They yeah. also didn't have cows. That's right. Didn't have sheep. Right. Didn't Mary, have pigs. Ugh, that would have been good. Um, let's see. Mary Young Perkins says, happy Sabbath to all from Maryland. So um, that cut off because I said, Mary. <laughs> 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 and I have to be careful because when I say that, she responds. Yeah, very okay. responsive. So. You have to remember, don't say yeah, that. It's like right. it's like saying um, when I talk to 
when I talk about my dog and I say, hey, Ruffy, you want to go outside? He gets all excited. Next thing you know, the dog's barking because he go. thinks, okay. There you go. All right, anything else? Uh, are we uh, that's what on? I've got for now. Let's, um, okay. you've got something for us, and I need to go uh, focus, right? Yeah, do the focusing thing. All right, two weeks ago on SOS program number 60, we addressed the question of whether or not Jesus was a false prophet. Because there are those out there who say that Jesus made some predictions that never happened. And if you missed that show, you can find the YouTube link uh, at dynamicchristianministries.org. That's uh, SOS number 60. Real quick, quickly, here's an example of a scripture that people use to say that Jesus was mistaken on when he thought he was going to return. Jesus said in Matthew 24, 34, I tell you the truth, this generation will not pass from the scene until all these things take place. Also, people say that in Revelation 22, Jesus said three times, I am coming soon. But he didn't say he was coming soon. All right, we've already addressed these back in SOS 60. We're not going to do it tonight. If you're interested in that, go back and see it. Uh, DynamicChristianMinistries.org. Tonight, we're going to look at the apostles. Because there are some Bible skeptics who say that the New Testament writers thought Jesus was going to return in their lifetimes. And these Bible skeptics think that these New Testament writers didn't just think it. These folks say the New Testament writers taught it and they wrote it. And here's the kicker. Here's the part that I really enjoy. Some folks out there get mad at me when I point out that preachers today have no business leading people to believe that Jesus is going to return in our lifetimes today. I say that because no one knows when Jesus is going to return. No one. And, and, and you may feel it in your bones that Jesus is going to return real soon, but you can't prove when Jesus is going to return. Nobody can do that. And when these preachers teach this nonsense, it causes damage to people who hear this stuff and get caught up in it. And the defenders of these headline theology preachers have told me this. They say, so what if these preachers are wrong? And these people say, these New Testament writers believed it and they were wrong. And to that I say, hogwash. The New Testament writers did not believe that Jesus was coming in their lifetimes, and they certainly didn't make that claim in their writings that we call the New Testament. Now, did the apostles promise that Jesus is going to return and clean up the earth and set up his kingdom? They absolutely did promise that. And on SOS, we believe those promises too. We teach it. This is the cornerstone of our faith, that Jesus is our Savior. He's the Christ, the Son of the living God, King of kings and Lord of lords of this new age, and he's going to set up, uh, he's going to set up that new age on this earth. Why don't you turn off the air? And like the New Testament writers, we long for Jesus' kingdom. We constantly pray, thy kingdom come. But we don't preach on this show that Jesus is going to return in our lifetimes or in the next five or seven years or really, really soon like you hear so many preachers say now and they've been doing it for decades because no one knows when Jesus is going to return. So these people who defend headline theology, they use this excuse for the failings of those who have this prediction addiction. These people say, well, these guys today might be a little bit wrong on their timing, but so what? The New Testament writers were wrong too. And when they take this stance, they're putting themselves squarely into the corner of the people who reject the Bible and also say, all oh, those guys who wrote the New Testament were all messed up when they believed Jesus was going to return before they died. And I'm telling you, all of this is wrong. So what we're going to do tonight is examine some scriptures. We're going to look at some of the verses used by the Bible skeptics and used by the defenders of headline theology and they claim that these scriptures demonstrate how the New Testament writers were wrong in their claiming that Jesus was going to return in their lifetimes. And I'm really going to be trying to be fair to these folks by looking at the Bible verses that they think make their case the best for them. Since we don't have time to look at every scripture that they use, I've sincerely tried to pick the scriptures that they think most strongly makes their case. Nancy, could I get you to go to the uh, uh, camera? And uh, right now, focus on this, mm -hmm. and then when um, uh, a little bit later, then uh, resume the focus, okay? Because what I'm finding is people can't read this, depending on where the camera's focused at. 
So you have to go back and forth. All right. Let's start with 1 Corinthians 15, 51, which says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Now let's be clear. If Paul had said I, this would have been a false prophecy. But Paul used we, and that makes all the difference in the world. Let's review something. And again, we've already touched on this in uh, SOS 60, so I'm not going to repeat the whole thing. But I'm going to look at this from uh, this next point from another angle. Question. Is the New Testament, or the Old Testament for that matter, are these Western books? Is this book, Old Testament, New Testament, something that reflects the way of thinking of the Western mind? Is the New Testament based on precepts of Western civilization? Absolutely not. How do we define Western civilization? Well, Western civilization is summed up in the histories and literature of places like Western Europe and the United States. But the Bible is in no way a book that reflects the thinking or mindset of Western Europe and the United States. And I know that makes people mad, but that's a fact. Now, there are those who say that we Americans and Europeans regularly reflect the teachings of the Bible. And, and, and I wish that were true all the time. But it's not true all the time because many times we then project our Western values onto the Bible and try to shape it into our own image. Too many times that's what we're presenting to the world, our reshaping of the Bible in our own Western image. And we not only do that with the Bible, we also do that with God. We try to shape him in our image. It's like Isaiah 29, 16 says, You have turned things upside down as if the potter were regarded as clay. Who's the potter? God is the potter. Who's the clay? We're the clay. And Isaiah 29, he's telling the ancient Israelites, you're trying to reverse that. And when the Western Christianity performs this act of trying to mold our religion and our God to our standings, then it makes it so much easier for, when they do that, it makes it so much easier for them to reject things like the Seventh-day Sabbath and the laws of clean and unclean. Just two examples. When Western Christianity does this, it makes it so much easier to artificially insert pagan practices into their Christian worship. When Christianity does this, it becomes easier to embrace pagan practices. Let me say it again. The Bible is an Eastern book. It's an Asiatic book. It's based on the Hebrew religion of Eastern peoples. The Hebrews and the Israelites and the Jews were not Europeans. They weren't Americans. Their roots and their thinking and their approach were totally Asiatic. Now, here's where we run into the pitfall of, view, of, of viewing our belief system as being part of the Judeo-Christian ethic, ethic system. And I don't want to come across as being against Judeo-Christian Judeo ethics because I'm not. But I've got to point out that there are some pitfalls in putting too much emphasis on this idea of Judeo-Christian ethics. Let's look at this briefly. And this is all going to tie back into the New Testament prophets. Trust me. Because this business of tying this all in together can get us off track if we're not careful. Let me show you how. What's the definition of Judeo-Christian ethics? And I believe that the best definition is this. Judeo-Christian ethics are those values that are held commonly by Judaism and Christianity. Now, if you have a better definition, please put it down in the chat room. Send it to me. I'm open to a better definition if it's out there. But for now, I'm running with this definition. Judeo and Christian, Christian ethics are those values that are held commonly by Judaism and Christianity. Now, let's analyze this definition from the point of view of the ecclesia. Let's not just take for granted that this definition sounds real pretty and then move on without talking about it. No, let's stop. Let's look at it. How would you describe us, you and me, the ecclesia? I think the best descriptor for us is that we are Sabbath-keeping Christians. Now, are we saying that anyone who doesn't keep the Seventh-day Sabbath is not a Christian? Absolutely not. We don't say that. Determining who is a Christian and who isn't a Christian that's a judgment that only Jesus gets to make. We don't have that authority. We're only humans. 
Still, as we accept Jesus as the only way to salvation, the only path, and as we maintain obedience to God's law, we find ourselves being Sabbath-keeping Christians. Now, keeping all this in mind, I believe the two precepts of this definition, Sabbath-keeping Christians, are first, the acceptance of Jesus as the only pathway to salvation, and second, observing the seventh-day Sabbath. Question. Do Judeo-Christian ethics maintain that Jesus is the only path to salvation? No, it does not. Jesus being the only path to salvation is not part of the Judean Christian ethic, and we, because we know that Jews today do not accept Jesus as their Messiah. Second question. Do Judean Christian, Judeo-Christian ethics maintain that God's law must be kept, including the observance of the seventh-day Sabbath? Of course not. Most Christians today do not accept the seventh-day Sabbath. So right off the bat, we in the Ecclesia need to be aware that there's a problem if we start embracing this concept of Judean Judeo-Christian ethics, if we try to embrace it too closely. Because right off the bat, our definition of ourselves... Sabbath-keeping Christians clearly doesn't fit in with Judeo-Christian ethics. And this is the very reason why I don't jump on this bandwagon uh, of this business of posting the Ten Commandments on public property. Now, that's someone, some of you are going, whoa, wait a minute, what are you talking about? And remember, this is a Judeo-Christian exercise, putting the Ten Commandments up everywhere, especially on public property. Property. Why do they want to have the Ten Commandments put up all over the place? Well, because they say that the Ten Commandments are part of what they call our Judeo-Christian heritage. But this action of posting the Ten Commandments usually has a big, big problem, and here's where the problem comes in. Hansen, do you need to focus on this picture? Every time I see a picture of the Ten Commandments that the Judeo-Christian people post on a wall or on a block of granite or something in some public park, I usually see that the fourth commandment is almost always abbreviated. All, and maybe there's some exceptions, but most of the time it's abbreviated. They almost always word the fourth commandment like this. Remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. And that's all they put there for the fourth commandment. And then religious people go and they look at this block of granite, they go there to feel all good about themselves and about this Judeo-Christian society we live in. And they read the fourth commandment on this hunk of stone. And these people actually believe that's what the fourth commandment really says. But does the fourth commandment really say, remember the Sabbath to keep it holy? No. It says in Exodus 20. Let's read it. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do your work, but the seventh day day as a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall do no work, neither you, your son, your daughter, your male, your female servant, your animals, your foreigner residing within your towns. Verse 11, for in six days the Lord made the heavens and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. When the Judeo-Christian people put this abbreviated fourth commandment on stone, it is ecumenicalism at its best. Yes, this is a form of ecumenicalism. Because they're pleasing most Christians when they post it. And I think they're pleasing most Jews when they post it. But I don't see how this abbreviation pleases God. And if you disagree, say so. Talk to me in the chat room. All right, I'm not done. I'm going to quote one more thing about Judeo-Christian ethics. The following was written by a fellow named Adrian Mangiu, spelled M-U-N-G-I-U. You can look it up on the internet. M-U-N-G-I-U. And I believe Mr. Mangiu's words accurately sum up what Judeo-Christian ethics are all about. Quote, America was founded by men with very strong Christian values. These Western values refer to North America and Europe west of Russia, obviously. So far, so good. Still quoting, It is not exclusionary, but rather honest and accurate to say that America was founded and shaped by Judeo-Christian Western values. Again, so far, so good. But get this, 
Eastern values are not the same as America's. And he references things like Hinduism, Islam, Buddhism as examples of Eastern religions. But did you get that? Eastern values are not the same as America's. What this guy says is really typical of the mindset of a lot of people who promote Judeo-Christian ethics. And what this guy says, it indicates a total lack of understanding about what the Bible is all about. Again, the Bible contains Eastern values. The Bible is not a Western book. Now, the West has adopted it. The West has latched on to it in the same way that they latched on to Jesus and then turned him into a European-looking guy who did away with his father's law. And all of this is bogus. As long as these guys admit that their Judeo-Christian religion is a Western religion, as long as they deny the fact that the Bible is an Eastern book, an Asiatic book, they're going to miss out on many important truths. Now let's be clear. On SOS, do we teach that this Eastern approach to the Bible means you should go out and start learning to read Hebrew? No. Do we need to start calling on God by the Hebrew names? No, we don't say that. So please don't read anything more into this other than what I'm saying, which is the Bible's not a Western book, and we've got to work real hard because we've got prejudices. We've got to work real hard not to view it through the lens of Western culture because when we do that, we come up with erroneous conclusions like the one we're talking about tonight that the apostles were mistaken when they said that Jesus would return in their lifetimes. All right. I've dumped a lot of stuff on you just now, haven't I? And I'm asking you to please try to keep all this in your mind as we look at Hosea chapter 12, verse 2. Hosea 12, 2. And please hang in there, because we're going to get back to this supposed misunderstanding that the New Testament writers had regarding the timing of Jesus' return. But we've got to look at Hosea uh, 12, 2, because we're still trying to understand this Western versus Eastern mindset. We think that Hosea lived around 721 B.C. and before. Would you please write that down? Write on a piece of paper. Hosea, 721 B.C. Let's read Hosea 12.2. It says, The Lord also brings a charge against Judah and will punish Jacob according to his ways. According to his deeds, he will recompense him. Verse 3, He took his brother by the heel in the womb, and in his strength he struggled with God. Yes, he struggled with the angel and prevailed. He wept and sought favor from him. He found him in Bethel, and there he, meaning the angel, spoke to us. And there he spoke to us. Now, wait a minute. This doesn't make any sense. Hosea is acting like his contemporaries were there with Jacob, and they weren't there. Let's back up. This Hosea passage is talking about the patriarch Jacob who was the father of the nation of Israel. His name was later changed to Israel. When did Jacob live? Well, if we can believe Usher's chronology, Jacob lived somewhere around 1750 B.C. Would you please write that down under your Hosea thing? Write down Jacob, 1750 B.C. This Hosea passage is talking about a time way before Hosea was even born. Look what you wrote down. You wrote down Jacob, 1750 B.C., Hosea 7, 21 B.C. When you do the math, isn't there something like a thousand years difference between the time of Jacob and the time of Hosea? In Hosea's passage that we just read, he's referring to the account in Genesis 25 where two twins are born, Esau and Jacob. Esau is born first, and if you know anything about birthing twins, you know that after the first one comes out, usually the second one comes out later, not immediately. But what do we have in Genesis 25? Esau comes out of the womb and immediately his brother, who's still inside the womb, reaches out from the womb and grabs his brother's heel. And, and this grabbing had to happen within a second or two of Esau leaving the womb. And this act by Jacob, who's still in the womb, grabbing his brother's heels, it was so astounding that the people back then decide to name the second kid, the one who grabbed his brother's heels, they named the second kid Jacob, which is derived from the word heel in Hebrew. And we know from the history of this guy, Jacob, that he becomes a supplanter. He was constantly reaching beyond his grasp. 
He was not of good character. He was unethical. He used deception against his own father to get what he wanted. He used strong arm tactics against his starving brother to get what he wanted. This is the kind of guy that Jacob was. Then later on, Jacob has this wrestling match with an angel. And the angel talks to him <coughs> in Genesis 28 and makes some wonderful promises. And Jacob responds in the right way to these promises by saying, The Lord will be my God. A change takes place in Jacob. A conversion experience takes place. Now, this interaction with the angel is what Hosea is talking about in Hosea 12 too. And Hosea adds at the end of this passage, And there he, the angel, spoke to us. He says there, in that place, at that time, in that moment, the angel spoke to us. But again, wait a minute. Hosea and his people that he was writing to, they lived during his lifetime. Hosea, this is hundreds and hundreds of years after this incident took place at Bethel with the wrestling match and with Jacob being told of his blessings and with his responding, the Lord will be my God. Now, what in the world is Hosea talking about when he says the angel spoke to us there in that place at that time in the moment? This statement makes no sense to us. Hosea and the people of his time weren't even alive when this Genesis 25 wrestling match took place. And when we get confused by this type of Old Testament writing, our confusion is caused by the fact that this passage in Hosea showed a very Eastern way of communicating. Again, a lot of the stuff in the Bible doesn't quite fit in with our Western way of thinking and communicating. What Hosea, what Hosea is saying at the time, saying to the Israelites at the time, they need. To, he's saying you need to be remembering the promises that were made to your father Jacob and that you should be responding the same way he did with the Lord will be my God, just like Jacob. Hosea gives this message to the people of his time by throwing in this literary device that the angel was speaking to them like they were there hundreds of years later. Again, not literally speaking to them because they weren't there with the angel, but he's saying that the angel figuratively spoke to them centuries later. Now, please keep that thought in mind as we look at one more thing before we go back to 1 Corinthians 15.51. Again, we're, we're setting the stage for understanding what 1 Corinthians 15, 51 is all about. Let's turn to John 20, verse 29. Oh, man, the evening is going by too fast. Here in John 2, uh, 20, 29, we have a marvelous passage that talks about the ecclesia. Here we have Jesus making a prophecy. Let me read it. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Period. Full stop. And now we have a new sentence. This next sentence is not a dependent clause. It is a complete standalone sentence. He says, Blessing, I'm sorry, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. He's talking about the future. And let's be clear. We see instances where Jesus would be really pleased when his disciples would finally catch on to things that he'd been trying to get across to them for some time. Remember what dunces they could be at times when Jesus was trying to teach them. Like trying to teach something to buckaroo bob sometimes. But then there would be some wonderful aha moment like we see in Matthew 16, 16, where Jesus asked Peter, he says, who do you think I am? And Peter says, you're the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus says, blessed are you, Simon, son of, of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by the Father in heaven. All right, back to John 20, 29, where Jesus is saying to his disciples, he said, you got to see all kind of cool things that I've done. Miracles like turning water into wine, walking on water, healing the sick, casting out demons, all of this. You're convinced of God's truth because you've seen so many things, and, I, and I'm happy that you believe. He says, but I got to tell you, there are going to be others later who are going to believe who have never seen all these great miracles that I performed, and guess what? They are so blessed. Now, who in the world is Jesus talking about? Talking about you and me? We didn't get to see all the miracles like the disciples do, or even like Paul got to see when he lived with Jesus for three years in the desert. Yet, even though we didn't see these things, we are believers. 
And when we believe, it's a miracle. When we believe, it's a supernatural occurrence performed by God. It's a wonderful thing. And Jesus said, we are blessed. And I have no doubt, and I'm going to go out on the limb here, I have no doubt that the disciples and Paul had to marvel at the very thought that there would be people like you and me in the future who never got to see the great miracles done by Jesus, yet these people were going to be, be believers just like they were. That's us. This concept had to be astounding to them. They had to think about people in the future, who, and it seems to me that they would have to think, I want to be in their company. I want to be identified with them because their belief in the future is totally and completely a wonderful miracle since they didn't get to witness all the miracles of Jesus like we did. So I believe, and again, you may not like this. I think I'm going out on a limb, and I'm admitting it. I believe that Paul would welcome the opportunity to put himself in the company of the end-time ecclesia when he wrote in 1 Corinthians 15, 51, and 52 that we shall not all sleep. Now, who is this we that he's talking about? He's talking about this wonderful group of miraculous believers who are going to exist in the future, people who weren't born and didn't live in Paul's time. This 1 Corinthians 15 prophecy is for those believers who will exist during the tumultuous end times, whenever that's going to be. Now, someone says, no, it's not. 1 Corinthians 15 was written for the people of Paul's time. And when they make that statement, I say this. Stop thinking like a European or an American. Stop thinking like a Westerner. At least try to set your mindset to match that of the Bible writers who were Easterners. Like in Hosea 12.2. Try to put yourself into the mindset of the Asiatic people who lived in Hosea's time, who understood exactly what the prophet was talking about when he said that the angel who wrestled with Jacob a thousand years prior spoke to them, people who lived thousands of years later. 1 Corinthians 15, uh, 51. We shall, not be, uh, uh, we shall not sleep, but we shall be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, and we shall be changed. This prophecy is for those Christians who will live in the end time. Will it be us? I don't know. Nobody knows. I hope this is for us, because I hope that the kingdom of God happens soon. I pray for the kingdom of God to return every day, but I fear that Jesus' return might not be within my lifetime. But that's not important. Let's get to the important stuff. But the when of Jesus' return is so unimportant. What's important is that if we don't get to be changed in the twinkling of, the, of, the, of an eye in the last trump, then instead we'll be re resurrected at the last trump. And, and that's just every bit as good. It doesn't get any better than that. Again, if Paul had said, I will not sleep, but I will be changed in the twinkling of an eye, that would have been a false prophecy. But he didn't use the word I. He said we. And the key to understanding whether or not this passage is a false prophecy is to understand how Eastern people use the word we. All right, let's keep moving. We, we spent a ton of time on one scripture. We, unfortunately, we don't have time to spend this much time on each of the rest of the scripture. All right, we talked about what Paul said to the people in Corinth. How about what Paul said to the people in the Roman church? And here's a passage that Bible skeptics use to quote-unquote prove that Paul was mistaken in believing that Jesus would return in his lifetime. Again, this is the passage that some Christians use to show that Paul was mistaken. Romans 13, 31. All right, here's what it says. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, 13, 31. Oh, let me put it up on the screen. Yes, there it is. Romans 13, verse 11. It says, And that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of our sleep, for now our salvation is nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. New International Version says, and do this, understanding the present time, the hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber, because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. And remember our three rules of real estate? We talked about this. What are three rules of real estate? Number one is location. The second one is location. The third one is location. 
Same with understanding scripture. The rules of understanding scripture, there are three of them. There are context, context, context. So let's ask this question. Is Romans 13 talking about the new age? Is it talking about the return of Jesus? Is it talking about the setting up of the kingdom of God in this earth? No. That's not the context. Then what's the context? Romans 13 is talking about Christian living. It's talking about getting along during this age with the governments of this age. It's talking about our conversions. It's talking about how we comport ourselves as Christians. So when Paul says the hour has come, when Paul says the night is spent, when Paul says the day is at hand, he's talking about our stepping individually out of darkness and into the light as we accept Jesus as our personal Savior. Romans 13 has nothing to do with end time prophecies. Yes, Romans 13, 11 does talk about a transition, but it is not a transition from the present age to the new age. It's about a Christian's personal transition from darkness into the light of Jesus and his shed blood. Let's go to the next one. 1 John 2, 18, it says, Little children, it is the last time. And as you have heard, the Antichrist shall come. Even now we there are many Antichrists, whereby we know that this is the last hour. Interesting phraseology, the last hour. Now, 2,000 years ago, John told his readers it was the last hour. We just read. And when John talked about the last hour, John was not mistaken in believing that Jesus was going to return in his lifetime because John was not talking about the second coming in 1 John 2, 18. Again, context, context, context. Remember that in Matthew 24, Jesus made it very clear that certain things were going to have to take place before the end was near. We talked about that two weeks ago. This phrase, last hour, as mentioned in 1 John 2, it simply means the end of the time of the apostles or the end of the apostolic age. Let's talk about this. By the time John wrote this passage, most of the original apostles were dead. John was probably the last apostle to die, and at the time he wrote this passage, I kind of think that he was the last one alive at that moment. In this passage, in this whole context, was John proclaiming the return of Jesus. I'm talking about that. This passage has nothing to do with the end of Satan's age and the setting up of the new age. Read the whole chapter. Context, context, context. Let's stop here and see if we can put this into a more modern perspective. And I want to con compare this passage to something that happened on July 4th, 1826. And that date was the 50th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence. And on that date, July 4th, 1826, there were only two of the original founding fathers still living, John Adams, Thomas Jefferson. On this date, all the other founding fathers were dead. On the morning of that date, July 4th, 1826, it was almost the end of an era, the era of the Founding Fathers. And as John Adams lay dying that day, one of his last utterances was, Jefferson survives. Adam knew that he was dying, and he concluded that after he died in the next few minutes, Jefferson would be the only one left. And a little historical footnote, Jefferson also died that day. I think actually before Adams. So by evening of, of that day, July 4th, 1826, the era of the Founding Fathers was over. The point is this. When Adams said Jefferson survives, he was merely pointing out that the end of an era was soon coming upon the nation. He was pointing out that the original guys of the revolution were all about to be gone from the stage of history. Now again, we've said before, context, context, context. What was the context of John's phrase, this is the last hour? Again, he was not talking about Christ's return. He was talking about the current state of affairs of the church at that moment. Read it for yourself. He wasn't looking at the whole world and the whole age. He was talking about what was going on in the church in that particular time. In this chapter, John is talking about the false teachers that were setting up a new false Christian religion. And the religion that these false teachers were setting up was something that was the antithesis of the true religion of the Bible. And this new religion 
that Paul, that that, um, uh, uh, that John was talking about came from the, from false teachers, and that's what John was talking about. Now, this new religion wasn't Buddhism, Islam. Had, no, it couldn't have been one of those three religions or any other one, because John is warning the church about those who had left the faith. He's talking about guys who had once been followers of Jesus, who were by that time taking the name of Jesus and using Jesus' name to promote a false Babylonian Western religion. They were setting up a counterfeit Christianity. And remember that John wasn't the only New Testament writer who warned us about these false ministers setting up a new false religion. That's a subject for another time. Again, John's not talking about the end times in this passage. He's warning the church that the original apostles were going to be gone soon. And that there were already false teachers out there who had left the true religion to set up the fake religion. John knew all about this false Christian religion that would teach about doing away with the commandments. And John knew that as long as the original apostles were around, this new fake religion could be countered. But he knew that once the original apostles were gone, this religion was going to take off. It would grow legs, and we know from history that it did, and we know from reading his writings in Revelation that it was going to happen. And it was going to be around in the end times like it is today. Paul knew that once the last hour was over and once the original apostles were gone, the, apostle, the, the apostasy would take off like no one could have imagined. Again, this chapter of 1 John has nothing to do with the end of Satan's age or the setting up of a new age. Instead, it has everything to do with warning the church to be aware of the apostasy that was going to spread like wildfire. All right, let's quickly look at James 5, 8. James chapter 5, verse 8. Be ye also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Again, you're getting tired of me saying it. Context, context, context. We can't take one scripture out of its place and then come to some erroneous conclusion about it. What's James talking about in James 5? What's the context of this situation regarding history? James is complaining, he, he's talking, first of all, he's talking to converted Jews. And he's complaining and griping about rich Jews who have placed too much emphasis on money and physical wealth. It's right in there. At the time of his writing, this particular writing, the ecclesia was being oppressed by those who were in power in Jerusalem. And remember that the early persecutions of the ecclesia were done by the rulers of Judah, Judea, and the later persecutions of the ecclesia were done by the rulers at Rome. At, at the time that Paul was writing this epistle, it was the Jewish leaders who were persecuting the church. The temple in Jerusalem was still standing at the time of this writing. And James is telling the church that the Lord is indeed coming, not to set up a new age, but to punish those who he writes about in this chapter. The Jews who were into money and who were persecuting the church. And we know that the ecclesia fled from Jerusalem before the destruction of the temple, and they ended up in Pella. Again, the context of this verse has nothing to do with Jesus returning to set up the kingdom. The context of this verse is about the difficult conditions the ecclesia were living in at that moment in that particular place. In this passage, he's warning the rich oppressors, he's warning them, and he's telling the brethren to have patience. And he's relating the value of prayer and faith. I think we got one more, and uh, we're a little over time. Let me get through this quickly. 1 Peter 4, 7. But the end of all things is at hand. 1 Peter 4, 7. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. 1 Peter 4 is remarkably similar to the context and message of James 5. 1 Peter was also written not uh, too many years before the destruction of the temple. And 1 Peter 4 is an encouragement for the ecclesia to hang in there. Once again, this passage in 1 Peter 4 has absolutely nothing to do with the new age. As it is not a promise that the new age was imminent. When Peter says the end of all things, he doesn't mean everything in the whole wide world. He's referring to the bad things that the church was experiencing at that moment. He's talking about, and he, because he knows that they're going to be heading on into Pella. Peter was not predicting the coming of Jesus uh, happening in their lifetime. All right. Now, um, I, we got to stop here. We have got tons of material. 
And um, let me, uh, are, are you ready to talk about the chat room? Let me let me talk about what we're going to talk about next week. Let okay, me give everybody you do that, that, you do that first and I'll pull okay. up the chat room. Next week, Nancy and I are going to talk about reaching out to young people with the message of the gospel of Jesus. We're going to talk about that. Because it's not happening. We're not doing a good job of it in the ecclesia. We need to have some growing, vibrant churches that have a lot of young people, and we're not doing it. we got a problem. We're going to talk about it. Now, it's interesting because um, over this last week, I've gotten some really good stuff, an email from Bill Evans, Rod Kuzman, Peter Kamen, and Richard Maxwell. And I think I want to, uh, and a lot of what they said ties in with what we're going to talk about. Uh, and again, this is, uh, you know, next week. And we're going to start off with this fascinating topic. We're going to talk about the building, well, I'm going to talk about the building of the Panama Canal. What a monumental event this was. And the lessons, there is a big lesson in the building of the Panama Canal that we in the church can learn. So we're going to talk about that uh, next um, uh, Friday night, and uh, Nancy and I are going to do this SOS together. 63. So, SOS 63. Uh, so um, anyway, that's a, a precursor. So what do you got for us in the chat room tonight, Nancy? Okay, we're going to start with uh, YouTube this time around. Um, Trudy Cranford points out, but no, uh, the day or the hour, no one knows, even the angels in heaven or the sun, but only the Father... And um, she posted, let's see, Matthew 24, 36 through 42, and Exodus 31, 13, mm -hmm. and Ezekiel 20, 12. So I hope you wrote those down and that you pay attention to them. Um, Z. St. Hope said the first commandment, the fourth commandment, and the sixth are always shortened. Oh, on these uh, Ten Commandment mm -hmm, things? Mm -hmm. You know, you're right. I, I should have mentioned it. The first commandment? And the fourth and, and the sixth, right? Isn't that what she said? Mm -hmm. That's right. Good point. Thank you. Okay. Um, and then also, let's see. Birgit says she actually disagrees with you about posting the Ten Commandments. It is better than no guidelines posted at all. Okay. And Good anyone guess. who wants more can read for themselves. Okay. And Linda Satarsky joined us. So Hello, Linda. I've caught all the comments on YouTube. I think so. Okay. Okay, uh, Jamie Cunningham joined us from, um, she's with the SDA group in Ohio. Hi there. Uh, Richard Maxwell points out that not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. Mm -hmm. Daryl Ambrose says, uh, Jesus said that when you see the abomination of desolation, um, assuming we would be watching, so I guess uh, referring to your saying no one knows the day or the hour. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Again, um, there are so many things that Jesus listed. One of them is the abomination of desolation, which has to do with the temple. And some people think that there's not going to be a temple built um, before the return of Jesus. Some say that the temple in that reference um, has to do with the church. I believe it has to do with a real physical temple. I think there's going to be one built. And until that temple is built, Jesus can't return. Mm -hmm. According to the, th not that he, he physically can't, God won't let him. It's just that it wouldn't fit in with what we're told to watch for, the abomination of desolation being one of the many things. Mm -hmm. And we can't build the temple as long as the uh, Al-Aqsa Mosque is sitting up there. Now, I know that Dr. Ernest Martin has done some excellent research, uh, the late Dr. Ernest Martin, and he said that, uh, that, that uh, the site of the Al-Aqsa Mosque is actually not where the temple was. Mm -hmm. He said the temple was actually a couple miles away from there. And they could build a temple there. And, and that's fine. I get that. The point is, no one's building a temple right now. I mean, we're reading all kinds of stuff about the ashes of the red heifer and how their uh, uh, Gershom Solomon's group is putting together uh, the vestigers and everything for the priests. And they're working on all this stuff. But the point is, there, there ain't no building. And when you see a building get built, uh, maybe, we're, you know, maybe we're getting really close. But for now, that's years off. Okay. All right. What else? Okay, let's see. Willow Laval says, the Bible said in two places do not add or take away from the scripture, meaning adding or taking away from the Ten Commandments, I'm sure. Okay. Uh, Sharon Lewis says, meaning, the meaning and the reason for the Sabbath was given by our Holy Creator. Jen Tarter says, your commands, your comments on posting on the commandments have given me a lot to think about. Thanks. Okay. Uh, Willow Laval says, we see things from the lens of human nature. Mm-hmm. 
Richard Maxwell says Jacob means deceiver. I think he posted that before you said it. Mm -hmm. He okay. beat you to it. Um, let's see. Or so, or supplanter. That's right. Mm -hmm. um, Amy Holmhurst, Holmhurst says she's using a Bluetooth and could hear well. There were some comments about the sound, which is why I went and listened to it. It's a little tinny, but it sounded fine to me. So okay. I think sometimes people on the receiving side have problems. Okay. Sorry about that. Yeah. Uh, Richard Maxwell says, live your life every day in Christ as if it were your last. That, um, and like we pointed out yes. before that that is how we are to live, but that is not the same as saying Jesus himself could come tomorrow. Right. There's, there's a slight different in, difference, maybe not in how you would live your life, but in the message you take to the world. We commented on that last time. Yeah, exactly. Again, um, I could die tomorrow, and my next moment of consciousness, bang, the kingdom of God's going to be here. So sure. for me, the kingdom of God could be tomorrow if right. I died, in, in, a, in, in a sense, not literally, but figuratively. Okay. Uh, Mary Nguyen Perkins says it is important that Jesus find faith on the earth when he returns. Whether we are alive or in our grave, graves, we must stay faithful to the end. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Richard Maxwell says people also use Romans to say we don't have to keep the commandments of God. There's a lot of things to say that. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, let's see. And um, Sorry, I'm skipping a few to try to get more people in. James Maranek says, God and time don't work on a clock. A day in heaven is like a thousand years. Exactly. This whole time thing that we, that we experience, God experiences time on a totally different plane than we do. And I'd love to sit here and explain it to you, but I don't understand it. It's, just, it's, it's, it's an infinite concept that we don't understand with our finite minds. And, and that's a really good point. He, he experiences time totally different than we do. So. Would you change that? Change that? Yeah. Why? Because the thing is focusing on it. I'm hoping it will. Oh, okay. Face All right. Um, so, uh, let's see. Uh, Jen Turner says, great show. What's in Nancy? Missed Bill. Can't wait to see next week's topic. Will of Love Alice says, it's a timely subject. Bill Bratt says, great info from your lecture. Your presentations are always interesting. Your start of Sabbath is a great way to start our Sabbath. Thank which you. Which is why we needed that. Yeah, and, and I hope that you find these things interesting. I hope you find them informative, maybe even entertaining. But here's the thing. You don't have to agree with me on everything. If you want to disagree uh, on anything that I say, that's fine. All this stuff is to help you to study your Bible more, to encourage you. And because um, you got to come up with your own conclusions on this. Because in the day that you stand before Christ, I'm not going to be there with you, and you can't blame me. So, so study your Bible. Uh, you know, learn all these things. And and um, if, if you enjoyed the show, let me ask you a question. Um, uh, the question is, how much money have you sent us? Hopefully and zero. Hopefully, <laughs> hopefully zero. We, we tell you not to all we, the time. We tell you not to. And yet some people try to give us money, we give it back. No big deal. Okay, we don't want your money. We're self-funded. We don't need your money. But thank you anyway for those of you who offer and those of you who try. But we do want some, uh, something from you. Uh, it's very important that, that you remember that we need two things out of you. And the first thing is we need your prayers. We believe in the power of prayer. And therefore, we ask that you please, please pray for this show. And I know there are a few of you out there watching the show. I, I know because I hear about you and I hear from you once in a while. You hate this show. And you're watching it because it's like a, a snake uh, swallowing a rabbit. And you just can't take your eyes away. It's so hideous and ugly. And, and I know you're out there. And that's fine. You're so welcome to watch the show. If you feel that way about the show, you need to pray about this show. We need your prayers too that God will straighten me out and get me on, on, on the right path. So whether you like the show or don't like the show, please pray for the show. So that's what we ask for, prayers, and hit the share button. It costs you nothing. If you find value in this show, please hit the share button because if you find value that others that you know will probably find value in it too. Or um, if you're watching on YouTube, uh, highlight the um, uh, URL. URL. And um, uh, send that to people that you know you think would like to watch the show. Okay. And you can highlight the URL and put it on yeah. uh, the Facebook, link. too. The yeah. link. Okay. Yes, okay. Um, so, let's see. Uh, Daryl Ambrose wants to know, so if the Father calls, does it mean we aren't doing our part if nothing is happening? I don't know. That's, that's an excellent question. 
it, it, is it our fault if nothing's happened? If nothing's happening? It, well, oh, if, if, if it depends, oh, are, we, okay. are we sowing the seed? Are we getting yeah, the I, gospel out there? I don't know. Because I think the imp implied in that question is maybe the Father's not calling people, oh. and therefore it's not our fault. And that may be the case. I do, uh, so I don't know the answer to that question, but I do know this. A lot of stuff that's being preached by the church is junk. And we talk about this, we're going to talk about this more next week. There's a lot of junk being taught out there by the churches. And how is God going to bless us if we're teaching junk? we got to talk about the Bible, about the blood of Jesus, how Jesus uh, were saved through the blood of Christ, how, how we've got to follow God's law, how God loves us, how we sh should yearn for the kingdom of God. These are the way to your matters of the law, how we should love each other, even our enemies, and do good. This is what we need to be talking about. But there, we're not talking about that. We're talking about stupid stuff like church eras and top-down government. And Hey, don't preach next week. Oh, all right, this is next week. All right, anyway, okay. we're going to talk about this next week. So I don't know the answer to, to the question. Maybe God's not calling anybody now. Maybe, you know. Remember that, that it, it, it says that there's not going to be a famine of the word. There's going to be a famine of the hearing of the word. That tells me the hearers are not hearing it, but the word that's being preached is worthwhile. And right now I have to question whether or not some of the stuff that we're preaching is worthwhile. Bill Bratt, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, Bill Bratt wants to know if the temple has to be a building. Could it be a tabernacle? Diane Webb says it needs to be a phys physical place to sacrifice. Uh, Daryl Ambrose says, right, right, archaeological and biblical proof proves temples were not on the Temple Mount. Okay. You t um, Christ's prophecy is coming to light now. Not one stone will be left upon another. Mm -hmm. So she said, YouTube Temple, I guess, is mm -hmm. what she's trying to say here. Yeah. Um, Sharon Lewis says, have a delightful, spiritual, fulfilling uh, fellowship tomorrow. Richard said, Maxwell says, there are many Jonas out there, those that have been called and are bearing their talents. Yes. Yeah, there are so many out there that could be helping. I shouldn't have to be doing this, frankly, but uh, there, there are others who were called before me that should be doing what we're doing, but they're not doing it. They're not even going to church. A lot of them have rejected the Bible, have rejected Christ, have rejected God, or have accepted some kind of a universal, uh, you know, God that's nebulous, not the God of the Bible. And these are the guys that God called to do this job, and they're not doing it. So others are having to step up to the plate and do it, and that's why you're stuck with me. Because you probably know all kind of ministers who used to preach, and they preached well, did a good job. And now that the, some organization can't give them a paycheck, they're saying, well, if I can't get paid for this, I'm not doing it. I've, they've told me that. They, they have said that to me. Well, since I'm not getting paid, I'm not going to preach the word. And in, in that case, the guy has turned himself into a hireling at that point, that he's only doing it just to get paid. And there are guys that should be doing this and aren't doing it, and that is such a disappointment to me. People I've looked up to since I was a young man. Okay. Uh, on YouTube, Z Saint Hope says um, all the commands are still ap applicable, admonishing us all to live godly, peaceable lives, and that the temple needs to be physical because a geographical location is given to the Jews to flee. Okay. Paul Shaw says if you count the tent tabernacle, the third mm -hmm. temple is actually the fourth temple. Okay, that's that's a good point. Yes, thank you, Paul. That's a good point. Um, Birgit Seller says this is enlightening, and thank you for using this. Um, so, or for doing this. Uh, I would also point out, um, I did mention it before, a couple of prayer requests. Mimi has dropped off because uh, there's a thunderstorm where she is, so she might have lost electricity. And also, um, prayers for... Uh, uh, a guy named John Jones, who's the relative of a friend who just found out he had cancer. Okay. Friend of John Jones. No, John Jones is the guy's name. Oh, John. Okay. A, a friend of a friend of mine. <laughs> okay. So the the guy that has cancer is John Jones. Mm -hmm. So please put that on your prayer list. 
and please be praying about John Jones and Mimi's electricity situation. Uh, Willow Love Al says, we love you, Wesley. We love you, too. And, again, and we, that we do this for you. Yes. We enjoy it, so we're lucky in that. Yeah, um, we have a ball. There, there's no way that you can have as much fun as Nancy and I have. I guess I should but say we're blessed in that. We, we're blessed to have an opportunity yeah, to do this. We are so blessed. We love doing this. And we look so forward to being with God's loving people and the love that's, that's manifest and demonstrated when you're here in the chat room talking to us. We thank you so much uh, for your Christian love and for your prayers uh, because we can't we can't do this without God's blessing, and we feel that God blesses it because of your prayers. So thank you very much. And again, the privilege is ours that we get to serve you. So we, we enjoy the heck out of this. So, Okay, anything else? Okay, just a couple more comments about the temple. Birgit Seller said, wouldn't the temple be built um, if the people are called uh, to the body? Uh, maybe it is not about a physical building at all, just a spiritual building of the congregation, to which Trudy says the temple will be rebuilt, sacrificing will start, if I remember correctly. Uh, and Birgit says the temple was run by whom last time before Rome was destroyed? And it was the Levites. The Levites. Levitical priesthood. Before Rome destroyed it, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so... Uh, and uh, Carl Nocturne says you can't have sacrifices without the temple. Sadducees were the priests. I guess he's answering the Roman time. Yeah. And Birgit says, or, sellers, <laughs> Birgit says, how are we to find Levites and especially Aaron's descendants? Ex 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 excellent question. Yeah. And um, here's how, this is what they say. Now, this is not me preaching. You see, I, it, it's not my responsibility to set up the sacrificial system. So it's not my job to go out and make a determination. You can be a priest and you can't, okay? And remember we talked about, we talked about tithing. We said there were the Levites, and in the, in the Levites there were the descendants of Aaron who were the priests. Mm -hmm. So the priests were a subset within the set of the Levites. Mm -hmm. And the, this is an excellent question because they think that they know who the Levite people are today. They say they're the Jewish people that have the last name of uh, Lewin, Levi, Cohen, and other names like that. In fact, once a year in the uh, temples, anybody with those names will stand up and they're asked to give a blessing onto the rest of the congregation mm -hmm. because that's, they say they're getting a Levitical priesthood uh, blessing. Mm -hmm. Okay, but once you determine, if that's correct, that if these people with the names Lewin, Lewis, uh, Levi, and Cohen, if they are indeed uh, Levites, how do we know which ones are descendants of Aaron and which ones aren't? Because there was a really, really clear distinction made in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. I don't know the answer to that. I don't think anybody else does. But I guess a, 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 another answer, that's one answer. Another answer could be this. And that is that um, uh, maybe there are going to be Levites who are giving the sacrifice in the end times that are not really, we don't know if they're descendants of Aaron. I mean, maybe they're going to be doing it wrong. Who said they're going to, because I, I don't know that it's going to be a situation like it used to be where, you know, the tradition is that if you went into the Holy of Holies and it wasn't the Day of Atonement and you weren't the high priest and if you weren't barefooted and if you weren't wearing white, you know, you know all those things that the only mm -hmm. circumstance you can go into the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement, mm -hmm. you would die. The tradition is that they that a lot of the high priests died. That's why they put bells on them so that they could hear them moving around. And if they stopped hearing bells, they knew that the high priest had died in there. Mm -hmm. And so eventually, supposedly, it got to the point they tied a rope around the high priest before he went in, he had the bells, and if they heard a big crash... And it got real quiet. They knew he died, so they pulled him out on the rope, and sure enough, high priest is dead. Okay. I don't know if that really happened or not. I, I know I read about that in history. Who's to say that in the end times, when we do have the temple, if we have a temple, that if there's a violation of the Holy of Holies like that, that by sending in a Levite who's not a priest, who's to say that he's going to be killed? Mm -hmm. Am I rambling too much, or am I making just... Hopefully a little bit of sense here. Um, and, and, and when the um, enemy does the abomination of desolation, he apparently is not going to get struck dead by going into the Holy of Holies, is he? Mm -hmm. 
So if they have a priest in there that's a Levite, but not of the, of the uh, lineage of Aaron, why would he be struck down then? And, and again, I don't know the answer. These are only questions. i got a million questions. No, i got two million questions. <laughs> I don't have any answers on that. Maybe we need to do a show on this one of these days. Maybe. Uh, Daryl Ambrose says, uh, could it be DNA? And Bill Bratt said, I heard something about the Aaronic, Aaronic Levites that had special DNA. I don't know if that's true or not. I think here's the problem. No one took DNA samples from Aaron. And how far back do you have DNA samples to to show you who? I think you can prove maybe even the tribe yeah. Levites, but I I think you would have a hard time proving Aaron unless you had DNA from way back. Now maybe Aaron's bones are still around. You can find them. You could get DNA. All right. Two things on that. Number one, we don't have to go all the way back to Aaron. We only have to go back to the time of Jesus when they knew. Instead of having to go back 4,000 oh, sure, years sure. ago, we only got to go back only, only 2,000 two, two years. But people still weren't collecting DNA back right, then. Right, but, okay, which brings me to my second point. This is all speculation. Is it possible they will find some treasure trove of bones of uh, Aaronic priests? Yeah. I mean... Yeah, they'd have, to find, they'd have to find the bones to do that. Yeah, they'd have to find bones from the time of Jesus mm -hmm. because... Uh, um, or shortly thereafter because the temple was destroyed in 70 A.D., mm -hmm. And after that, it's going to be really difficult to find out. Uh, it would be difficult to find bones that are marked that way. Because remember, the priests all died in the temple. Mm -hmm. They weren't given good burials. I think they were just thrown in pits by the Roman soldiers. Mm -hmm. So we would have to find nice burial graves of, of Levite priests that have been buried and consecrated and, and all that before the destruction of the temple. Okay. That, Okay, and Richard Maxwell points out that God will not be in the temple and there's no need for the sacrifices. Jesus fulfilled them. Okay, all right. All right, let's see if there's any YouTube comments and then we should wrap it up. Yes, we should. Um, so, uh, uh, Carl points out that there's no Ark anyway. Um, yeah, what are they going to do about the Ark of the Covenant? Yeah, uh, and that though some claim to have seen it in tunnels under the Temple Mount, I saw it on a movie. Um, Barry says they say they found it under the Temple Mount. Yep. Um, Indiana Jones. What's that? Uh, what's this guy, that guy's name? Um, Harrison Ford. No, no. no. Oh. Harrison Ford was based on this guy. Oh, I don't. Not know. Vindal Jones, but the other one. Somebody in the chat room knows who I'm talking about. He's the guy that got kidnapped by the um, uh, the Kurds uh, because oh. he was out looking for the uh, uh, Noah's Ark. But supposedly the same guy, I don't, I've got his books in there in my, in my study. He's the one that said he was crawling around and found the uh, Ark of the Covenant underneath uh, where uh, Golgotha was. Okay. Paul Shaw wants to know if, he, uh, if we think that the most like, or he says he thinks that the most likely place the Ark might be hidden is the Temple Mount. And then um, Z St. Hope asks a question. Can, could the son of perdition be of Aaron? There's no reason that he couldn't be. Mm -hmm. So yes, I think that could happen. I don't think there's, you know, the the original um, guys that were apostates were all Jews. So it's it's possible that the that the uh, antichrist or whatever could be Jewish. He could be Levitical. He could be from the tribe of Aaron. We don't know. Okay. Good question. And Richard Maxwell says some people say Ethiopia. Well, we almost go uh, gone a half hour over time, and so we should probably wrap this up. Then. Okay, let's have a closing prayer. Let's do it. All right, would you bow your heads, please? Our Father in Heaven, once again, we are so thankful to you for uh, the love that you show to us. We thank you, Father, that um, we have uh, Sabbath services to go to tomorrow. We ask for your inspiration on all your people who are going and traveling to different congregations we uh, pray that you will encourage them to do this. We ask for their safety. We ask that uh, while they're there, they'll fellowship in love and show mercy to their brethren who have uh, wronged them and who have sinned and who have done things. Because we need to be a church of love. We need to be a church that follows Matthew 5, 6, and 7. So please be with us uh, on this Sabbath day as we uh, very gladly and very gratefully embrace your Sabbath and follow your uh, law regarding that. So now we ask for your dismissal from the show this evening. We thank you for your presence that you are here tonight and we give you praise and thanks 
for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. See you next Friday night. We're going to talk about the Panama Canal. All right. In the meantime, go out tomorrow, fellowship. If you've got a group near you, fellowship online if you don't or if you're not feeling well. Hope those of you who lost electricity get it back. Uh, Ron, Ron Ron Wyatt, is that the guy here? Ron, Ron Wyatt, yes, that's the guy. All right. And pray for uh, John Jones and his cancer situation and Mimi's electricity situation. And have, have a, a good, good Sabbath. Sabbath. Now you're going to make me go get it. I'm too tired. You know how old I am? Oh, wait, the camera's still on. Everybody knows how old you are, babe. <laughs>